you know, if you happen to have something which has constant magnitude, so I have this curve traveling through space, but the magnitude of the curve is fixed. And uh, you could say, well, how is that possible? And we said, well, one way you, you could have this happen, and we drew this, is if you could imagine that you lived on a sphere. And so even though you traverse on a sphere, you're moving around, but if you think about the, the center being the center of the sphere, the, the magnitude is the same because you're traveling on the surface. So if your magnitude is fixed, we said, hey, it's got to be the case that if you look at your position and you look at your velocity, your perpendicular, now I said velocity, that's sort of getting ahead of where we're going today, but uh, the derivative saying, what's our change? So that's the theory. Let's see it in practice. All right. So I have this particular curve here. R of t, 1 minus sine of 2t, root 2 times cosine t plus sine t, and then cosine 2t. The claim is this has constant magnitude. All right, well, we'll verify that. And then the, the claim is that r and r prime are perpendicular. So we'll verify that as well. So let's just check constant magnitude. So I'm looking at the magnitude of r of t. Well, if I want to check constant magnitude, oftentimes it's easier to check the constant magnitude of the square, just because I only care about you know, what's inside the square root. The square root itself is not too important. All right, so what does this become? Well, 1 minus sine of 2t quantity squared plus root 2 times cosine t plus sine t, again, squared, plus then cosine of 2t squared. So now, uh, one of our funnest things to do, algebra. OK, uh, that's always a good day. So we start carefully working this out. So the first term, well, that'd be 1 minus the cross terms, 2 sine of 2t, then plus sine squared of 2t. Okay, that's just the first term. Uh, the middle term, well, the square root of 2 squared become 2, so plus 2, and multiply everything by 2, so cosine squared. Then I'm going to have my cross terms, and there's that extra 2 coming in, so that's plus 2 times 2 cosine t sine t. Then I ran out of space, so I'll go to the next line, plus 2 sine squared t, that's the last term. And then, of course, there's this final term over here, cosine squared of 2t. All right, so that's what I get when I square everything. Now, fingers crossed, nice things happen. Because we're good people. Nice things should happen to us. OK, now our, our other fun thing, trig identities. Well, does anything simplify nicely? Well. Cosine squared, sine squared. In fact, we have a couple of those. There's a sine squared, 2t, and a cosine squared, 2t. Now, I'm mixing these two together because the insides have to match. So I can't say, oh, there's a sine squared, 2t, and a cosine squared, t. No, 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 those don't match. So even though it looks like they're related, no, they're not. They're not. Different insides. But, OK, so that becomes the 1. Now, we already had a 1 there, so there's a 1. We just found another 1. All right. Is there anything else? Oh, yeah, the 2 cosine squared, 2 sine squared, that's 2 more. All right, so we're up to 1 plus 1 plus 2. And, uh, oh, I said I already got that one. But now, notice I haven't accounted for everything. I have this minus 2 sine of 2t, and over here I have plus 2 times 2 cosine t sine t. So, ooh, boy, what happens there? Yeah, there's a double angle identity. It's suggested that we might want to know a double angle identity because look, it doubles the angle, 2t. So sine of 2t can be rewritten as 2 sine cosine. And if you look, these match. Well, not exactly. You have different sine, 
So in fact, they cancel. So we're left with 1 plus 1 plus 2, also known as 4. Wait. Wait. Right, right. There's this 2 here. So this, sign, this 2 here comes from the double angle identity. Oh, no, no. It's, you should always challenge me. I do make mistakes. And two people are too afraid. I don't want to ask a question. Believe me, I make a lot of mistakes. But I learn a lot, too, because I learn from those mistakes. Okay, so constant magnitude has been verified, because it's a constant. So now, well, the claim is that r and r prime are perpendicular. So let's write r prime again. So 1 minus sine of 2t, root 2, cosine t plus sine t, and cosine of 2t. So what does r prime become? So that's good time to remind ourselves. How do you take a derivative of a vector value function like we have here? Entry-wise, entry -wise, one part at a time. See, it's no much harder than what we did before in Calc 1. It's just we get to do it more often. Once for each entry. It's like three times the fun. Okay, the derivative of 1 minus sine of 2t will be negative 2 cosine of 2t. All right, comma. Well, square root of 2, I can pull out. What's the root of cosine plus sine? That should be cosine minus sine. Normally we would write it as minus sine plus cosine. That's easier for us to see what's happening because the root of cosine is negative sine. The root of sine is positive cosine. The root of cosine 2t? Minus 2 cosine sine 2t. Okay, so the claim is that they're perpendicular. How do you verify two things are perpendicular? Dot product is zero. So if, you're, if there's a claim that says, hey, these things are perpendicular, you always think, let me check the dot product. That will tell me. Then I'll know. All right. So does this equal zero? That's our question. We don't know. Does zero equal r dot r prime? Well, that says I multiply the entries together. Okay, so the first entry if I just multiply here, and I'd get minus 2 cosine 2t two t from that there. Then plus 2 sine of 2t cosine 2t. Okay, so that's the first term multiplying together. Next, well, root 2 times root 2 is 2. What do I get when I multiply cosine t plus sine t times negative sine t plus cosine t? Yeah, notice that it's essentially, you can think of it as like a plus b, a minus b. a plus b, a minus b, that's a squared minus b squared. So that becomes cosine squared minus sine squared. Then at the end, the last part, well that's a minus 2 sine of 2t cosine 2t. Okay, so if all goes well, we should get cancellation. Now, two things cancel right away because they have exactly the same form. One is plus and one is minus. Namely, that 2 sine 2t cosine 2t. No surprises there. But then we're left with these other two pieces here. And the question is, do they in fact cancel? Now we go back to our trig identities. <coughs> Maybe we'll start here. Cosine squared minus sine squared. I know that cosine squared plus sine squared, there's a nice trig identity that says it equals 1. Is there a trig identity for cosine squared minus sine squared? And what is it? It's cosine 2t. And once you write it in that form, you say, ah, it's exactly what needs to be to cancel. So yes, there's no question. They are, in fact, perpendicular. So this curve has the properties that we claim, namely that magnitude is constant 
and the R and R prime are perpendicular. Now, if you were to plot this, you get something that looks like that. Now, it's not entirely clear what that's doing because you have to remember this is sitting on a sphere. So this is roughly what it would look like if you drew it on a sphere. It's kind of like an infinity symbol, just sort of drawn on a sphere, if that makes sense. Just depends on your angle as to what you see. All right, good. So, that's that example. Any questions? Well, not seeing any questions, we move on. So today we want to talk about motion. And so we're going to go through and say, what is motion and the various aspects that are involved? So we start with something really simple and say, look, we're going to have our vector value function, we're going to have it r of t, and we're going to say, look, r of t is representing position. Now, again, I understand it's kind of strange to think about a vector as representing a position because we've talked about a vector is really about differences not about locations. However, for convenience, we need to have something we can do calculus with and we say we're going to translate what would be a point into a vector. We, by the way we do it, we, we nail down the start of the vector to be at the origin so that it's really a vector that points to where you're at. And that's what you can think of, is if I start from the origin and I want to point to where I'm at, that's the vector that I'd get. So it always tells me where my position is. Now, when we talk about motion, we want to say, well, how are things changing? So, if I want to know how things change, I look at the derivative. So, r prime of t, which, of course, that says take the derivative of each entry. That tells me how I am changing. So, no surprise, there's a little note that says, hey, this is how position changes. But we have a name for that. What tells you how position changes? Velocity. Velocity. So... We call this our velocity function, shorthand v of t. All right. So if you think about it, you might say, well, this is just telling me how I'm changing in each direction. But if you know how you're changing in each direction, you know the total change. So that's all right. All right. Now, velocity has two aspects to it because it's a vector. And every vector has two aspects to it. One of them is the direction, and one of them is the magnitude. What's the magnitude of velocity? Speed. It's the speed. Okay, so if I want speed, take the magnitude. And if I want direction, well, that usually means find a unit vector and you scale out. But this will be a, a very convenient thing, especially when we get into our, our next lecture. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. All right, well, what, what's the next thing? Third derivative? Second. 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 Yeah, second derivative. I mean, yeah. I mean, we've already have had first derivative, but what about second derivative? Well, of course you can. Now, if I want the second derivative, what do I do? How do I find the second derivative? Yeah, take the derivative of the first derivative. And what it translates into is just says, take the derivative of each entry. Now, if the first derivative told me how my position changes, my second derivative tells me how my velocity changes. That's very reasonable. And we have a name for how velocity changes. What is it? Acceleration. All right. So now I have ways to find my position, my velocity, and my acceleration. Okay, well, I guess we'll just unveil this whole thing and read through it. So let's talk about the tangent line. So imagine I have a curve traveling through space. So we'll just sketch ourselves a curve really quick. So here's a curve traveling through space. And I might want to know properties about this curve. So one thing that's reasonable to know is uh, how can I locally describe this curve? And one thing that we can look at is we can look at a particular point and say, all right, 
what's the behavior? Well, one thing we can look at is to say, I need to know where I'm at, which is the position, and I want to know which way am I going, which is a direction. And so that information is contained in the tangent line. So if I look at the tangent line to this curve, it contains both position and direction of motion. And vice versa. If I, if I have the tangent line, I know my position, uh, I know the direction of motion. I don't know necessarily what the derivative is. I only know it up to a scaling factor. OK. But you might want to say, I need more. Look, I don't just want to have the position here, which is r of t, and the direction of motion, which is r prime of t. I want to store a little bit more information. So the next thing to try to store, the next natural thing is to say, well, look at acceleration, r double prime of t. Now, it tends to be the case that acceleration and motion don't have to be in the same direction. And in particular, if your curve is bending, that's a, sin, uh, a signal that the acceleration is not in your direction of motion. Why? Well, if acceleration is in motion, you will not change direction. What will you do? You'll speed up, or you'll slow down. Acceleration could be negative, but you're not going to change direction. So if your curve is turning, acceleration is happening not in your direction of motion. So you say, okay, so there's, there's a different direction. And most curves, by the way, that we're interested in tend not to be straight. All right, so there's a, an acceleration pulling us off to the side. Now, I want something that can store all this information. I want something that can store the point of tangency, the, uh, the direction of motion, and the direction of acceleration. And the way to do that is to work with a plane. So a plane can store a point and two directions. Because if you give me two directions, that basically fills up a whole plane. So there's a plane that exists that has that point, that direction, and that direction. And I keep reaching with that. That point being the point of tangency, the direction of motion, and the direction of acceleration. It's actually more or less a unique plane. Now, there's a few cases where it doesn't exist, but when it does exist, it's, it's unique. And what is it called? It's called the osculating plane. Now, I like to talk about the subject not because the osculating plane is important, but for a couple of reasons. First off, it's a good way to practice doing things, but also to expand our vocabulary. Practice our Latin a little bit. So tangent comes from touch. So a tangent curve touches the curve. Osculating comes from something like osculum, or my, my Latin's a little bit rusty. But it comes from something which means to kiss. So if you ever hear a couple of math people saying, hey, let's go in the back room and osculate for a few minutes. Now you know what they're doing. OK. <laughs> but anyways, it's sort of a, a nice thing. It's, it's this, this plane which is somehow kissing the pl this curve. And they said, well, look, we can't use the tangent because we've already used that to mean something. We don't want to confuse ourselves. All right. So again, osculating plane, the key idea is I have a point and two directions. Well, all right. Let's uh, try this out. Let's find an osculating plane to something. Now, I, I haven't specified the something here, so this is one of these fun times when you get to tell me what you want, to, want it to be. All right. What do you want it to be? Give me some functions. Not too hard, but not too trivial. <coughs> what? 2t squared. 2t squared. OK. How about we throw in a 1 there? Why not? Arctanol t squared. OK. OK. Lots of squares here. Arc tan inverse. I'm going to spell arctangent for a second. All right. All right, one more. E to the t squared 
minus 1. All right. Now, I should pause here and say I've actually not correctly asked this question. What's wrong about this question? I have to ha say when I'm interested in this oscillating plane. Because the oscillating plane varies. So sure, if, I'm, if I look here, I get this oscillating plane. But if I come back over here, I'd have a different oscillating plane. So the oscillating plane changes as I move along the curve. That's OK. We'll do it at time 1. OK. Well, what do I need? Well, for a plane, if I'm trying to make a plane, I always need two things. What are those two things? Point and normal vector. That's it. Every time I see the word find and plane together, I'm like, all right, I've got to find a point, got to find a normal vector. Where do I find my point? Yeah, I plug in, I plug in my, my one. So my point will be, well, plug in one. What do I get? Three. And then? Pi over 4. That's nice. Interesting. And now? 1. Because arctangent of 1 is pi over 4, and e to the 0 is 1. OK, so there's my point. Now, the normal vector. So now I have to find the normal vector, which is going to be perpendicular to the plane, because that's what a normal vector is. It's perpendicular to the plane. So, oh, hmm, OK. <sighs> well, let's think about what we know about this plane. The plane has to contain the direction of motion and the direction of acceleration. So let's find those pieces first. All right. So this is R. So let's find R prime. What is R prime? What's the first entry? 4T. The second entry? I'll give it to you. It's 2t over 1 plus t to the fourth. Because arctangent is 1 over 1 plus. Then you square the inside. That's t to the fourth. And then don't forget about the chain rule. Last entry? 2t, 2T e to the t squared minus 1. OK. So let's go and find the second derivative. Well, we need the second derivative. I mean, I'm, I'm saying let's find it, do we, but do we need it? Yes. yes, we will need it. Okay, we'll talk about why we need it in a second. All right, 4 is correct. Something, uh, okay, all right. Uh, bottom times the root of the top minus the top times the root of the bottom all over the bottom term squared. Don't need to simplify. All right, the next one will be what? 4t e to the t squared minus 1? 4t squared. Well, there will be a 4t squared e to the t squared minus 1. Now, that comes from you fix the 2t times by the root of e to the t squared minus 1. Is that all there is, or will there be more? Plus 2e t squared minus 1. OK, so th doing the product rule. All right. Well, I, I now have velocity and acceleration because velocity, that's r prime. Acceleration is r double prime. Now, notice that these are velocity and accelerations as functions of t. So they're not giving me the velocity at a specific point. They're just giving me velocity at a general point. I just have to evaluate which point do we care about or what time do we care about. One. So the next thing to do is evaluate these. All right, r prime of 1. So when I plug in 1, we get 4. four. 1, because we get 2 over 2. And then 2. two. So that's r prime. Now, r double prime of 1. 4, that one's easy. OK, and then something. Well, all right, all right. Uh, it would be 2 times 2, so that's 4 minus 2 times 8. 
So that's 4 minus 8 upstairs, negative 4, divided by 4, negative 1. Okay. And then the last one? Well, 1 is always nice. So it's 4 plus 2, which is 6. Now, which one of these is my normal vector? Neither of these are my normal vector. Why? Well, because I want the plane which has both these vectors inside of it. So whichever plane I have better have both of those vectors. So it can't be either, none of these can be the normal vector. In fact, if anything, the normal vector has to be perpendicular to, to both. both. Hmm. So, so I now have two different vectors, and the normal has to be perpendicular to both of them. How can one find such a vector perpendicular simultaneously to two different things? Yeah. Okay. This is something that you pick up on, especially as you start going through and doing the quiz problems. You're like, wow, I'm doing a lot of cross products here. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. All right. So to find the normal, I just take, I don't want the word just makes it sound trivial, but I take the cross product. Now it doesn't matter which order, r prime cross r double prime, r double prime cross r prime, because indeed we only care about the normal up to a scaling constant. All right, so we just start working this through. Um, all right, what do we get? We get i times 1 times 6, so that's 6i, so I'm going down, i times 1 times 6, j 2 and 4, that's going to give us 8j. k4 and minus 1 is a minus 4k. And now those are my downhills. I'm going to go up 4 times 1 times k, but because I went up, I need to subtract. So subtract 4k. Minus 1 times 2 times i. That's negative 2i, but I subtract it, so it becomes positive 2i. And then 6 times 4 times j, that's 24j. But again, I have to subtract. So subtract 24j. All right, does that seem reasonable? OK, so if we simplify this, we get 8 minus 16 minus 8. Maybe. Maybe we do. Uh, I hope we do. OK. Now, a couple of things. Do I care? Well, okay. There's two things I want to do, and I'm just debating which order to do them in. Let's do the logical thing first. If I'm paranoid about making mistakes, what do I do with this? I check. How do I check that 8, negative 16, negative 8 is the right thing? Dot product. Dot product. With, with what? Either. Yeah, either or. Okay, 32. Minus 16, minus 16. Zero, good sign. 32 plus 16, minus 48. Zero. Good. So, did we do the cross part correctly? Probably. Does it matter? No, because we're definitely guaranteed that this is perpendicular to both of the things we started with. So even if we screwed up the cross product, it is the right normal. So. But we probably didn't screw it up. Okay. Now, next thing. Look at these numbers 8, negative 16, negative 8. They all have something in common. What? Lots of 8s. Yeah. 8, uh, 8 is enough, I guess. Now, when we're talking about the normal vector, it says, look, we care about the direction. So here's something that you can do to simplify your life and say, I don't really care about this particular vector. I just need this particular direction. So let me simplify it by scaling by something nice. Or if you can think of it as sort of pulling out something nice, since they all have 8, I can say, look, it, if I pull out an 8, that's 1, negative 2, negative 1. So I can use 1, negative 2, negative 1 as the normal. I can, or I can use 8, negative 16, negative 8. It doesn't matter. As long as I have the right direction, life is good. Life is good. 
So, we're almost there. We're really close. We have our point. We have our normal right here on the very edge. So, last thing to do is to write the answer. So let's do, so the one negative two negative one, those are our coefficients. X minus two Y minus Z equals something. Because remember the form of a plane, AX plus BY plus CZ equals D. How do we get the D? Yeah, plug in our point. Now we're going to get 3 minus pi halves minus 1. So 3 minus pi halves minus 1 because I doubled the pi fourths. Now if you want, you can leave it like that or you can say, you know, at least I know how to subtract 3 from 1. I want to show my teachers I can do that. So x minus 2y minus e is 2 minus pi halves. Nice, nice. So. We like this type of problem because it sort of combines lots of ideas. Can you take derivatives? Can you take second derivatives? Do you know what the definition of an osculating plane is? Can you take cross products? Can you find a, an equation for a plane? All of these things are good things. All of these things are things that you should know. All right. So, are you happy with motion? All right. That's what they all say. Now, the nice thing about motion is like, look, if I know position, it's easy to find velocity. Take a derivative. But what if I don't want to do that? Maybe I'm in a different scenario. Hey, I want to find my position, and I'm given velocity. So we're not going to use derivatives. We're going to do the opposite, antiderivatives. Okay, which is about time. I mean, we, we did derivatives. We should take some time and do antiderivatives as well. Now, for derivatives, you do it entry by entry. For antiderivatives, you do it entry by entry. See, it's, it's very easy to remember. One entry at a time. Now, the only thing that's uh, perhaps a little bit tricky is when you do it entry by entry, you have to remember when we're talking about antiderivatives that you get constants. And there's not going to be a single constant. Rather, each entry gets its own constant added to it. Or a different way you can think about it is you can say, well, I have a constant vector. So the point is every entry gets its own little constant that you get to work with. OK. so. Let's do an antiderivative, and this is when I get nervous, opening it up to the floor. E to the T. E to the T. Oh, somebody likes me. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. E to the T. Cosine T. Times cosine T? No, 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 no. no, no, no. no, no. That's right. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Cosine T. Uh, four, <laughs> and we'll throw in a one over one plus t squared. Now you might say, whoa, 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 that's a four-dimensional vector. Can we do four-dimensional vectors? Yeah, as long as we're not doing a cross product, life is good. Cross product is the only thing that says, I'm sorry, you have to be in dimension three. So, okay, it doesn't matter. Works for dimension three, dimension two, dimension four. So the point here is that this integral, uh, I say integral, it's an indefinite integral. The point here is that you can think of it as instead of integrating this whole thing, as really saying integrate each piece. So you have the integral of e to the t dt, the integral of cosine of t dt, the integral of four dt, and the integral of one over one plus t squared dt, whatever that might be. So let's work it out. So what's the antiderivative of e to the t? E to the t plus c. Antiderivative of cosine of t? Sine of t plus? Okay, now we've got to be careful here. I don't want to use the same symbol 
because they don't have to be the same constant. So this is our chance to practice our alphabet. <laughs> D. Now, if you don't like practicing your alphabet, you start adding coefficients like constant C sub 1, constant C sub 2. That's OK. That works, too, if, you, if you're running out of letters. Integral of 4. 4t plus e. OK, integral of 1 over 1 plus t squared? Arctan of t plus f. Good. Now, that's the antiderivative. Now, I want to point out there was a claim that I can think of that says adding a constant vector. If you look at it, notice what we can do. I can say there's really two parts of this. So the two parts are the following. I have the, the e to the t, the sine t, the 4t, the arctangent t. And I'll think of those as, as my basic starting part, which is e to the t, OK, sine t, 4t, arctan t, plus, because I can, I can pull vectors apart. We oftentimes like to put things together, but we can also pull them apart. The other parts, which are these, these constants, c, d, e, f. So I get plus c, d, e, f. So the point here is this is an antiderivative. So just find one and then just say, hey, look, there's an extra vector, constant vector that you have to figure out. OK. Now, that's antiderivatives, uh, indefinite integrals. Same thing works for definite integrals. OK, so let's uh, try an example. So I want to find the following. I want to integrate something. But now it's a definite integral, so I have to have my bounds. So let's, uh, let's make this a two-dimensional integral. OK, you don't have to fill up the space. It's OK. What, what do you want in the first one? Four, Four <laughs> seems a little bit too simple. Maybe just a, turn it up a little bit. Five. <laughs> OK, well, well, that'll teach me to ask. OK, so five <laughs> t. OK, so we don't want to, want to take up the space here. OK, that's my first entry. I'll, I threw in the t. OK, all right. 2e to the t. 2e to the t, all right. And so then we have 2e to the t. All right. So yeah, we ran out of space, so we can only have two entries here. All right. Now, it's, it's a definite integral because I'm, I'm going to put bounds here. So that's my, my space, 0 to 1. Those are our, our two favorite numbers. So how does it work? Well, you can do it in sort of two different ways. So one way to think about it is to say, hey, let me just think about doing it as a definite integral of each piece. Absolutely works. Absolutely works. So integral 0 to 1 of 5 t dt, integral 0 to 1 of 2 e to the t dt. Or a different way is to say, let me just take the whole antiderivative at once. Uh, let's follow this one through. So if I follow this down, uh, antiderivative of 5 t. 5 halves t squared. I'm going to evaluate from 0 to 1. Uh, 2 e to the t, what's the antiderivative? 2 e to the t again. Evaluate from 0 to 1. And this would leave me with 5 halves minus 0, so that's 5 halves, comma. Here I'll be left with 2 e minus 2 e to the 0, but e to the 0 is 1, so it's 2 e minus 2. OK. The other thing is to say, you know, I'm just going to find an antiderivative of this vector valued function. So an antiderivative would be what? Well, just find the antiderivative of each slot, what we were doing over here. So the antiderivative of 5t, staying as before, 5 halves t squared, 2e to the t, antiderivative still 2e to the t. And I'm going to evaluate as a vector valued function from 0 to 1. So previously I was evaluating each entry. Here I'm saying find the vector valued function, evaluate the whole vector valued function. So if you do this, you'll get 5 halves comma 2e subtract 0 comma 2. So plug in 1, plug in 0, and if you simplify, you'll see this becomes 5 halves 2e minus 2. So the point here is either way works. You can work it entry by entry, or you can say, well, let me just find the, some antiderivative of this vector value function, and I'll evaluate 
both will get you the right answer. Okay. I'll come back to that one if you have time. So we're going to do almost the same thing now, but go back to our motion. So here we are. So given that we have some function, r prime of t. So we're not given r of t, we're given r prime of t. In other words, we're given a velocity. All right, so uh, in the interest of time, hmm, huh. I should probably never say that. That's just going to get me in trouble. All right, so. Uh, so 2t will be our first slot, pi cosine pi t will be our, our second slot, and uh, what won't get us in too much trouble? 1 over t plus 1 will be our last slot. Okay, so, so suppose that's our, our velocity function. And I asked the question, what is the integral from 0 to 1 of r prime of t? So we can certainly find it. So let's find it, and then there's a second part. This is part two. Interpret it geometrically. Now I'm going to wait to answer part two uh, until after we've, we've done part one. Okay, so let's actually work out part one. So I'm integrating from zero to one. I have two t pi cosine pi t one over t plus one dt. So, to do this, I can just find some antiderivative of each slot. An antiderivative of 2t? t squared. T squared. Antiderivative of pi times cosine pi t? Sine of pi t. Yeah. Antiderivative of 1 over t plus 1? Natural log. t plus 1. Okay, evaluate from 0 to 1. Well, hmm. plug in 1, we get t squared is 1, comma sine of pi, which is 0, zero. log of 2, which is log of, two. log of 2, good, subtract, plug in 0, 0 squared, 0, zero. sine of zero. 0, 0, log of 1, 0. zero. So I get a vector, 1, 0, log 2. All right, so that's a vector. Now there's a question which says, interpret this geometrically. Well, to do that, we should think about what's going on. So we have our three-dimensional space, and we have some curve in that three-dimensional space. Now I'm not going to attempt to claim that this is the curve, because I've, it's not. But pretend like it was. This is r of t. So as I move on this curve, I, I'm moving through space. Now I, that's r of t. That's not r prime of t. That's r of t. I integrated from 0 to 1 of r prime of t. What did I just find? Ooh, someone, uh, I heard the word, ah, okay. So suppose we put on our old calc one hats. They're a little dusty, you know, we've, we had to take calc two last semester, but you know, dust off the old calc one hats. If I were taking the antiderivative of r prime, what would it be? It'd be r. Because r comes, r is the, if I take the derivative of r, I get r prime. So the antiderivative of r prime is r. So one way I could think about this integral, I should do it with a different color, is I could say, oh, this is really r of t evaluated from 0 to 1. Because I just need to find an antiderivative. An antiderivative of r prime is r. So what's happening is if I look at this, this is r of 1 minus r of 0. So if this is, say, oh, let's say this is where I'm at at r of 1. And over here, this is where I'm at at r of 0. If I talk about r of 1 minus r of 0, what do I get? Well, I get a vector. 
because R T is vectors. So it's a vector, and I should do the start is the part being subtracted, the end is the part that's being added. So it's a vector that points R of 0 to R of 1. So that's what you found. Now someone said the word displacement, and that's the nice way to put it. Or at least it's a very fancy way to put it. It's how much you've moved. Now I have to be careful here because there's sort of two ways to think about it. So how much has the particle moved? That's this answer. It's the displacement. So it's R of B minus R of A. It's, that's how far the particle has moved. Now, I know we're going to get into semantics and people will, will disagree with me, but there's a second variation to this question, which is the following. How far has the particle traveled? Okay, so we're building up to our next lecture, and we have to build up to that because we need to end this one pretty soon. But you can imagine that I have this curve in three-dimensional space. Uh, this is the, the math department budget, by the way. We can, we can afford, you know, we get about two cents per lecture. So, uh, but anyways, the, the point here is I can think about I'm moving between two points. So if I want to know how far did I move the particle, well, I just say, well, what's the vector between two points? But if I ask how far the particle tra has traveled, I say, what if I made it into a straight line? That's how far the particle has traveled. It, it travels along that straight line. So there's two ideas. There's the how far has the particle moved versus how far has the particle traveled. So what we're going to do next time is really tackle this one, which is going to be our fun arc length type problems. And uh, you might have to say, hey, you know, we did arc length back in Calc 2. And those were fun. And you know what? It's going to be almost the same. It's still going to be fun. That's next time.